Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Servants of Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today we're going to continue our study through the book of James, looking today at the tests of true religion from uh, James 1, 26 through 2, 7. Would you please join me now in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is true, that it's living, that it's active, and that it penetrates into our hearts hearts, that it that through your spirit it brings conviction, but that you also bring gospel comfort. And so Lord, today I, I pray for our time today as we look at this very convicting passage, that you would do your work of conviction, but also that you would point us to Christ and that we would see not only our great need of you, but also that you provide uh, for that need in and through Christ. We just thank you, Lord, for this time that you've given to us to open your word and pray now that you would use it in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to James 1, 26 through 2-7. James 1, uh, 26 through 2-7. Hear what the word of the Lord has to say to us today. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue... Um, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who uh, who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? This is the reading of God's holy, precious word. And Paul knew that religious talk can be cheap. He says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19, keeping God's commands is what counts. And in Galatians 6, 15, he also says, what counts is a new creation. Now, James agrees with all of this. What impresses him him is devotion to God that manifests itself in concrete acts of love and righteousness. And now he mentions three tokens of of true spirituality in the passage that I just read. One in negative terms, two in positive. True religion is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This threefold test of religion fits James perfectly. It suits his emphasis on doing God's will. It also appeals to his activist readers. It is grimly stirring to read James 4.17, which says, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. There is something in many of us that longs to say, Just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. And this is why one reason why some people love James. His commands are so clear, so graphic, and so actionable. But James is also concerned was something even greater than these things. That is blindness and hypocrisy. In James 1.22, we remember he said, we dare not merely listen to the word. The word is a mirror to the soul. It reveals our moral and spiritual flaws. 
and we can amend them. James 1, 23 through 24 says, and when we obey the law, it gives freedom and it blesses all who live by it in James 1, 25. You see, we can gaze at the word without listening to the word. We can forget its objective claims and its subjective implications. Now, some people I think it's adequate to just make a profession of faith. But James says that we should control our tongues and be slow to speak, James 1.19 tells us. Our religious speech should be cautious too. If, if we profess faith and have no deeds, our profession, as we'll see throughout James, he says it's vain. James knows that, that religious claims may be vain, empty professions that fail to meet the standard of true saving Faith, but religion can be a positive term for James too. If religions, if religious claims prove genuine, for example, he says in James 1 26 through 27, if anyone considers himself religious and does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. If we join the negative and the positive statements of James 1, 26 through 27, we see that James sets out three tests of true religion. First, it controls the tongue. Second, it looks after widows and orphans in distress. And third, it remains unpolluted from the world. To this day, religious people may profess orthodox doctrines and even faithfully attend their churches every Lord's Day, but the proof of their religion lies in their behavior, James says. He unfolds the meaning of these marks of true religion, controlling the tongue, caring for the needy, and shunning the world's uh, pollution throughout James chapters uh, 2 through 4 first. James says, true religion bridles the tongue. Angry talk, gossip, deception are, are leading failures of speech. But James develops quite a litany of verbal sins. His concern for the proper and the improper use of the tongue are all throughout this letter. In James 1, 13-14, he warns against self-justifying speech. That is, when tempted, no one should blame God, saying, God is tempting me. In James 2, 3-4, he criticizes those who flatter the rich and humiliate the poor. In James 2, 16, he condemns the careless speech that wishes well, but never lifts a hand to help. In James 2, 18, he questions the superficial claim, I have faith if no deeds confirm it. In James 3, 9, he deplores tongues that praise God one moment and curse people the next. In James 4.11, he chides those who slander and even judge their brothers. In James 4.13, he condemns boastful plans as if one can do whatever one decrees. The tongue, James says, boasts and even curses and sparks conflicts that, that prove it is set on fire by hell itself. The heirs of true religion will reign in these sins. Second, James says that true religion visits orphans and widows in their distress. Now, the Old Testament usually calls this group the fatherless and the widows. For example, in Deuteronomy 24 and Jeremiah 7 and 22. But whatever the label, orphans and widows form a, a pair. They represent the poor, the defenseless members of society. They suffer poverty and exploitation. While man could, mankind exploits the defenseless, God protects the defenseless. Psalm 68 verse 5 says, He is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. Uh, Psalm 146 verse 9 says, God watches over them and curses those who deprive them of, of justice in Deuteronomy 27 19. And therefore the Lord commands Israel to follow him and show kindness to the most needy groups. In fact, they receive a portion of Israel's tithe, according to Deuteronomy 26, 12-13. And he also commands that they be given the opportunity to work. They may glean the corners of the field of, of Israel 
Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 19 through 21 tells us, so care for orphans and widows is essential for true religion. Above all, kindness to them is pure kindness. It is mercy for the sake of mercy because those who help widows and orphans cannot expect to receive anything tangible in return. Widows and orphans are likely to be poor for a long time. Further, kindness to the needy is godlike. We sustain aliens, widows, and orphans because uh, he sustains aliens, widows, and orphans, Psalm 146.9 tells us. In fact, Deuteronomy 10, 17 through 19 says the Lord shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the alien, giving him food and clothing. And you are to love those who are aliens, and you yourselves were aliens in Egypt. You see, God does love the poor uh, more because of their poverty, nor, nor does he love the poor more than the rich. But the rich have the resources to take care of most physical needs. The, the godly poor cry to God. They have no other help, and he hears them. We should care for the orphans because the gospel teaches that we were once poor and still are poor. The gospel of Jesus says what Jesus says in Matthew's gospel, blessed are the poor in spirit. That is, blessed are those who know their spiritual poverty. They know that apart from the grace of God, they are estranged from God and they are more desolate than orphans. By faith in Christ, we are adopted into the family of God. We should care for widows and orphans, thereby living out the gospel principle of adoption among the needy. Third, True religion is unstained by the world. James advocates separation in the world, not from the world. From one perspective, the world is simply God's creation, but the world is also a system of thought, a, a system of values. Those values so often contradict God's that James can say, and, and for example, in James 4.4, 4, friendship of the world is hatred towards God. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And James expects his people to remain pure while staying in this world. We, we do not stay pure by abandoning society. We do not gain purity by giving away our radio and our television or our smartphone or our laptop or our computer or any other device. Though we should avoid entertainment that promotes and even glorifies sin. The heirs of true religion neither flee the world, nor let it corrupt them. Physically, we dwell in the world, but morally, we keep our distance. We test all things and hold fast to that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. And thus, true religion remains undefiled. Now, the phrase true religion, it, it might sound strange to some people since it regards religion positively. For many evangelicals, though, religion is a pejorative. It suggests rituals of worship, human ceremonies, void of meaning and, and lacking biblical basis. These are the same Christians, quote unquote, that think they can do it by themselves without the church. We call these Christians Lone Ranger Christians. Religion signifies spiritual exercises that supplant biblical Christianity, the smell of incense, the, the chiming of bells, the habits and the rituals of vain spirituality. Religion, we feel, is, is what is left when the spirit leaves the building. Religion is also the term of choice for men of tepid faith, men who wish to add a dash, dash of transcendence to their designer lifestyles. Religious people, in this sense, don't talk much about their faith. They say, my religion is, is my private concern. It's, it's none of your business. And so we hold people at arm's length. And this leads some to say that the Christian faith is not a religion, for Christ came to condemn religion. And to be sure, some religious activities lead people away from the Lord. In fact, religion is usually a pejorative term in the, in the New Testament, for example, in Acts 26, verse 5. There, there is a piety that removes one from God. The Pharisees who thrived in James' era had such a piety. They honored God with their lips, but they were far from the Lord. They offered God deeds that were good as far as they defined goodness, but when they heaped up their good works. They neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. 
which Jesus talks to them about in Matthew 23, uh, 23. Their hearts were far from God. Their worship was nothing but, but rules taught by men. And so James uses religion positively here, for religion is defensible. Public displays are not necessarily contrary to true faith. Public ceremonies may be valid or even invalid. The Lord himself instituted some public rituals. He ordained circumcision, baptism, the, the Passover, the Lord's Supper. He ordered believers to worship him in sacred throngs in, in an incense-filled temple filled with choirs and well-robed priests. True faith manifests itself publicly and even socially. If someone questions the public display of religion, James says, in effect, does a show of religion frighten you? A religion that, that never shows itself publicly frightens me, he says. Intellectual theology, hidden faith, and knowledge that never drives to, uh, one to action alarms me, James says. Give me something visible. Prove your faith is real by doing the word. That is why he tells us not just to be hearers only, but doers of the word in James 1.25. And so James 1, 26 through 27, both conclude James 1 and introduce James 2. These two verses, they offer a final word on genuine faith. Earlier paragraphs said genuine faith perseveres through trials and receives the word as a means of persevering. And now James specifies the behavior that genuine faith will manifest. These are the marks of real faith, and these become the themes that James explores throughout his letter. Good deeds to the poor and the needy, they dominate James 2, 14 through 26, and control of the tongue is a theme of James 3, 1 through 12, and, and staying unstained by the world governs James 3, 13 through 5, 6. And yet instead of launching into these topics all at once, James begins with the apparent trivial problem of favoritism. And clearly his interest in, in proper treatment of the poor develops the widows and the orphans theme. But James has something more in mind here. And so James states his theme all at once. Those who believe in Christ should show no partiality. Indeed, James suggests that, that faith and favoritism are incompatible. To translate him literally in James 2.1, do not Hold faith in the glorious Lord Jesus with favoritism. The word translated favoritism is a neologism. It's a, it's a compound word based on the Old Testament phrase. To be hyper-literal here, James forbids Christians to receive a face. That is, believers should not prefer one person over another because of their appearance, their face, their clothes, or any other aspect of their life. Favoritism is is almost is a, is a constant in our society. In fact, some years ago, a group researched the way someone's clothing might affect the way others perceive them. I put a man on the street in a business district in New York City, pleading for cash with this line: "I've lost my wallet. I need money for a taxi to the airport. This is my name, my address, and my phone number. If you loan me the money, I'll repay you as soon as I get home." They put the, the same man wearing the same suit on the, on the same street using the same line on consecutive weekdays. But in a year when, when beige was a proper attire, he wore a beige overcoat one day and then black the next. The result? His proceeds on the beige day doubled his proceeds on the black day. It was simple favoritism. Humans play favorites. We judge by appearances. But thankfully, the Lord does not. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the hearts. In James 2, 2 through 4, James provides and sketches a vivid scene to illustrate his point when he says, Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and, and say, here is a good seat for you, but say to the other poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The people have gathered, of God have gathered, skeets are scarce. Two men arrive at once. One wears the fine clothes and the gold rings of wealth. The other wears shabby rags of poverty. 
Someone near the back watches them enter and even makes a decision. The rich, the rich man will take the last good seat. The, the poor man will stand at a corner or sit on the floor. The storytelling is, is sparse here. We do not know if the people have gathered to worship, to study, or perhaps even resolve a dispute in the community. We do not know if the two men are believers or not, if they attend regularly or not, if they have any friends in the assembly or not. We just know this. Two men enter a gathering of believers. One wears gold, the other wears rags. Today, a gold ring indicates marital status more than economic status, and costly clothes may not prove it a thing. If everyone wears blue jeans, clothes uh, lose their capacity to mark status, but we still have ways of identifying social rank, carriage, speech patterns, conversational topics, circles of friends, and leisure activities. Did you vacation with relatives in Tuscany last summer? All offer clues of social rank. Of course, today's ushers have been trained. They would never put a poor person on the floor, and yet we still find ways to favor people who look like us, who act like us. Someone may reply, yes, favoritism is wrong, but why even begin a discussion of true religion with such a trivial issue? It's hard to even stay aware of low-grade favoritism. Every culture and subculture does it. It's human nature, perhaps, but James is wise enough to analyze an apparent trivial issue. The, the little things we need to understand reveal the heart. The English have a saying, the true gentleman uses a proper fork even when he dines alone. The little things reveal whether our religion is true or false. And as trivial as it is, favoritism reveals true religion. Recall first that true religion helps the the poor. Favoritism insults and even dishonors them, even though God loved them and chose them for himself, as James says, In James 2, 5 through 6, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised for those who love them, but you have insulted the poor. True religion helps the poor, but favoritism insults them. That's what James is saying. The, The poor are forever told to sit in the back, to sit on the floor, to stand in a corner. But there is one community in the world where they should get equal treatment. It's in the church. As the saying goes, the the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And everyone who is seated with Christ has a prime seat. Rich and poor, young and old, male and female, all come as sinners in need of the grace of God. Whoever, Whoever we are by the world's standards, we are orphaned by sin and adopted into the family of God by the grace of God. In God's sight, we are one, and therefore the church should treat everyone the same way. And when we play favorites, we deny the gospel. By by the gospel, God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world. Favoritism means the poor get get a seat at the back and sit on the floor, even at church. Second, true religion is unstained by the world, but favoritism is utterly worldly. It continues the world's inclination to prefer the rich over the poor. Favoritism rejects God's decision to grant equal honor to the poor and the rich. Favoritism forgets God's will and seeks the favor of the rich by giving them special attention. In fact, favoritism really is foolish since the rich will often use their power to exploit the the poor, taking them to court and slandering the name of God. Third, true religion controls the tongue, but favoritism uses the tongue to hurt the poor. It may even be unintentional, but verbal snubs can wound. And so then favoritism fails every test of true religion. It abuses the tongue, it's stained by the world, and it insults the poor. Favoritism is so common, but James, in James 2.4, calls it a false judgment. It contradicts the values of God. It contradicts the gospel, for God chose the poor to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom of God. Morally speaking, favoritism is a social sin. Theologically, favoritism implicitly denies that God has chosen the poor. In, In the ancient world, the poor were despised or even ignored. They were exploited through slavery and controlled through handouts. We still have ways of despising the poor today, although some things have changed. For one, we differentiate between the poor. 
Our society today is a meritocracy, and so people of each generation earn their place afresh. If they have skills, if they have training, if they have education, if they have a good work ethic, they will rise. If not, they're going to fall. And so financial poverty does not by itself make someone an outcast. If a poor young woman is bright, articulate, talented, winsome, and attractive, we treat her well because we can foresee her future. If a young man is financially poor but otherwise rich, we will treat him with respect. We follow James most truly when we respect all of the poor. Those who are poor in personality, the dull, the complaining. Those who are poor in mind, the slow, the uneducated. Those who are poor in body, the wrinkled, the bald, and the overweight. In short, we should honor poor students who bristle with potential. We should honor unskilled laborers who will probably stay poor. In the gospel, God honors every son and every daughter who believes in him. The church is a family, not a club. And favoritism has no place in a family. And when we love and we receive all kinds of people, it shows that God's ways are becoming our ways. For God loves the poor. We emulate God's character and obey his will when we refuse to play favorites. James says that God shows those who are poor in the world. He means those are physically and financially poor, not just those who are poor in spirit. That does not mean that that God refuses to save the rich. There are many wealthy believers in Scripture, and yet, as Paul says, not many of the first Christians were powerful and nobly born in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 29. Most of the Corinthians were poor because most ancient people were poor. They were slaves, they were serfs, they were farmers, they were artisans, they were petty merchants, abounded. And earlier, God chose Israel and delivered her as as a slave nation from Egypt. And to this day, on a global scale, most people could justly be called poor. If God has bestowed his kingdom upon poor believers, we must respect them, James would say to us today. James adds, it is senseless to bestow special honor upon the rich. We should love the rich even as we all love all humanity, but, but God has not chosen them or, or even favored them, and therefore we should resist the temptation of favoring the rich and the powerful in hopes of, of gaining their favor to get something back. Don't bother, James says. The rich may, may take your favors, but they may not return them. And therefore, let no one be dazzled by wealth. Let us not even curry their favor. Using three rhetorical questions, James charges rich unbelievers as a class with three sins, exploiting poor Christians, dragging them into court, and slandering the name of God. In verse 6, James says, "Is not the rich who are exploiting you. Now, Israel was a small, densely populated land. Centuries earlier, Isaiah said in Isaiah 5.8, Woe to those who joined house to house, who had field to field, until there is no more room. In his day, as in James, a small number of wealthy landowners and merchants concentrated ever more land and wealth into their hands. They, they drove the poor from the land, making them poor still. James 2.6 says, Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? The wealthy use their influence to gain a veneer of legality as they threw the poor off their land. They they could charge high interest rates, impose fines for late payments, and then use the courts to force the poor to forfeit their inheritance. Such practices contradict God's law, which forbids Israelites from impoverishing their countrymen. James 2.7 says, are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name? We don't know precisely who the slanderers are here. But perhaps uh, rich Jews slander Christians for their claims about Christ, for their worship of Christ, for their determination to follow uh, his teachings. James chooses his examples wisely. And when we recoil, when we meet a shabby person who smells bad, even if they're our brother in the faith, we might be caught off guard. We tend to favor the rich over the poor. Does does this mean we fail the test of true religion? Now, James, we need to understand, has planned this question to arise in our hearts and in our minds. And at first, it may seem that he simply tells us we ought to pass the three tests of genuine faith. We must help the poor. We must treat them with dignity. We must assist them. We must not say, go, I wish you well, keep warm, and and stay well fed, as James 2.16 says. We must do something. 
But serious Bible readers wonder, can we refrain from favoring the rich? Will we really help our needy brothers or will we be content to offer kind wishes? And if so, will we have failed the first test? Our doubts intensify in the next section on control of the tongue, which which begins this way in James 3, 1 through 2 and 7 through 8. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that, that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. All kinds of animals, birds, and reptiles have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. You see, true religion, James says, tames the tongue. But James says, no man can tame the tongue, and therefore we fail test two. And the same happens with test three. True religion is unspotted by the world, but James says, we are adulterers who try to to love both God and the world in James 4.4. We want the world's riches, and we quarrel, and we fight for them in James 4.1. Well, James asks, are you feeling miserable yet? Are you feeling the weightiness of this? That's good because then we're ready for James' gospel only when we admit that we cannot pass the true test of religion on our own. As he says in James 4, 6 and verse 10, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. The simple question that we need to ask though is do you play favorites? Then it humbles us. And our failure obligates us to humble ourselves before the Lord and acknowledge our sin. We pray something like this, Lord, I am a sinner. I cannot stop sinning. I play favorites. I'm stained by the world. I ignore the needy. My tongue is out of control. My only hope is your your mercy. I, I resolve to do better. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. This prayer of humility is good for everyone. It's a good prayer for those who are unsure if they're right with God. It speaks to those who hope that they're going to heaven because they're trying hard to be good. It says that however hard you try, you'll never be good enough to earn your way into heaven. But God is gracious enough to give heaven to those who repent and believe in Christ alone. In fact, prayers of repentance are also good for those who know and love Jesus, who have asked him to forgive them of their sins. And because we sin daily, we need to repent again and again and again. We need to ask for grace again. (coughs) And we need to rest in the gospel again. We're never going to pass all the tests. We're not. Thank God Jesus passed them for us. And he made us members of his family. In the gospel, he has cared for our poverty and for our distress. And here's here's the thing as we we finish up this study today. What this what this passage should do is it should help us to see our inadequacy. It should it should help us to see, you know what? In our own power and our own strength, can we can we stop playing favorites? Can, can we stop uh not trying to, you know, we're going to resolve, you know, maybe not to use that kind of language or to do that kind of thing or, or whatever. And James says, you know what? What he's trying to get you to understand is in your own power, in your own strength, you're not going to be able to do it. And that's actually a good thing because it's there in acknowledging that we can't do it in our own strength and in our own power. That's where humility really comes in. And because what is humility? It's, it's recognizing who we are in light of who God is. It's, it's recognizing who we are in light of who God is. God is infinitely holy, majestic, and pure, and altogether righteous, and lovely, and holy. We are unholy. We are impure. We, we, uh, we, even to use the language of Romans, we, we sin in our, in our thoughts. We sin morally. We sin ethically. We sin religiously. We sin sexually. We sin in every way. All have sin. That's why Christ had to come. He had to pay this. He had to come under the sentence of death as a virgin born baby to pay the penalty for our sin in our place. And for our sin, that's why John uses the word hour, because that hour in his gospel is the hour in which Christ is going to die. He's going to pay that penalty. That's why 
That's why in uh, John 19, 11 says, it is finished. It is finished. It means that it's signed and sealed and delivered in the, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on our, on our behalf. And what that does is, coming back to James now, it, it helps us. It helps us not only to see our great need for Christ, but, but to cast ourselves on Christ at all times. You may wonder, how do I deal with that difficult person? How, how am I going to control my tongue in, that, in those moments? It's a good question. It's only by recognizing that you yourself can be like that other person. That that difficult person isn't the only difficult person, you know, in the room. That you have the same need as that person that you have a difficulty with. And, and the more that you, to, to go back to chapter one, the more that we can look at ourselves rightly in the mirror. And, and in light of the word of God, the more that we will humble ourselves. We'll recognize it's not that other person that is the most difficult person in the room. It's the person staring me right in the face, in the mirror. It's me. It's not them. It's me. And what that does is it helps us to rightly assess ourselves before God and to rightly humble ourselves before the Lord. That, that, that's why 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's what James is trying to get us to do. He, that's what he's going to try to do. And, and even this is a larger point of, of James's purpose in this letter. If we remember, as we've been talking about this in this series, James wants to take the truth that we that we know, that we say we believe, and he wants to see, oh, do you really believe it? Is it really true in your life, in your experience? Because if it's not, then, it, then you don't really believe it. And that's a hard word because uh, the, the, in, our, in our day, we, we think that we know something because we can recite a fact, an idea. But in the biblical mind, to know something is to know it in your heart. That's where knowledge resides in the, in the biblical mind. Knowledge is in the heart. That's why Jesus says in, in Luke, in Luke 6.45, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Because the heart is a seat of knowledge. It's the heart. Uh, Jeremiah 17 tells us the heart is desperately wicked. Why? Well, Proverbs 15 tells us there's, there's things that God hates. He, he hates pride. He hates a lying tongue. And, and on and on and on. Why? Why does God resist the proud? Because they don't recognize their need of God. After all, this is the Lord who upholds the universe by the word of his power. He sustains this planet. He, he causes our cells and our bodies to function in a, in a way so that we can breathe and eat and enjoy one another and have conversation so that our, even our brain cells function properly and our mouths function so that words come out and on and on and on. But these are all things that the Lord does. And what James wants us to get to understand is that walking and living in our own power, in our own way, that is why we are going to fall flat on our face time and time and time again until we really humble ourselves, until, until we realize, you know what, you really can't do this on your own. You'll never be able to pass a test. One of, my, one of my mentors says that God hand tailors the situations of our lives. God is sovereign over everything. He orders our steps. Things, are, things come into our lives in the providence of God that are, that are meant to help us to see our need. In fact, Hebrews, 
Hebrews 12 tells us that God even disciplines those whom he loves. See, God is at work in his providence. He's orchestrating even, even good things and difficult things for those who love him or are called according to his purpose. That's, that's a paraphrase of Romans 8, 29. But God is at work. He orders all things in, in the cosmos and in our lives, the trajectory of our lives. And he's doing it for our good. Tests, they dig up what's really in our hearts. They, they reveal things about our character like nothing else does. And that's why as we go through trials, we're not to lean on ourselves. Proverbs 3, 5, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge the Lord. Right? Trust the Lord. Why? Because he's good. And this is what James wants to do. He wants to take a little bit of truth, gives us a little bit of truth, and then what he wants to do is he wants to press it. He wants to see if it's true in the reality of your life. And it's very convicting. It's even painful. But you know what? We need to understand, friends, as we venture into this book, that even further, that conviction is a gift of God's grace to us. It's God saying, you know what? I love you enough. You're, you're going the wrong way. So I'm going to convict you. I'm going to convict you. you. You were going the wrong way. No, this is the way you're supposed to go. In his kindness, God brings conviction through the Holy Spirit to point us that, that we're going the wrong way. And, and the fact, this is a kindness of the Lord. God, the trials of our lives, they... They reveal our inadequacy. But even in, even in acknowledging our inadequacy, we can turn to the Lord, who the, who the Psalms tell us repeatedly, the Lord is our helper. He's, he's a rock of refuge. He's, he helps us. He's a strong tower. He, he is the Lord, our righteousness. So we can turn to him. We can trust him. We can tell ourselves the truth. Not the truth as we will want it, but, but the truth from coming from God's word, the Bible. So it's not just about what I feel or what I think or what, what Dave says. It's what does the Bible say? What does God say? And that's what James wants us to do. He is concerned that we would know all the right things, all the right ideas, and yet not really know anything at all, not have it impact our lives. That's why he says in James 1.25, don't be hearers only, but be doers of the word. Be doers of the word. That is, that we would know the truth, that we would walk in the truth, and that there would be outward manifestations of, of the work of God's grace increasingly in our lives as we are being conformed into the image of Christ. That is what James is concerned with. Martin Luther, that great Protestant reformer, said that the Christian life is one of repentance. It's, it's one of repentance. From the, from the moment we repent and we trust in Christ to the moment that we die, it, the Christian life is one of repentance. Repentance. Ongoing repentance. Ongoing confession of our sin, ongoing turning from our sin to Christ, putting our sin to death because of Christ. So today, maybe you, maybe today you're, you're feeling the weight of your insufficiency. You're seeing the, 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 weight, the weightiness of what James is getting at. And you wonder, what, what do I do? Well, very simply, I want you to flee to Christ. If you're not a Christian, I, I appeal to you in the name, in, on the basis of Acts 16.31, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Because it's only in Christ that you can find salvation. There is salvation in no other name, but only in Christ. That's the only way that, that you can have your need satisfied forever. You can be a child of God. 
But also to you who are Christians, I want to say this as we wrap up, and then I'm going to pray. The only way that, that you can address the trials that come into our life, and by the way, Jesus said this in John 16, 33, in this world you will have tribulation. That's what James is saying. You're going to face things in your life. You're going to face difficulties. You're going to face challenges. There's going to be times when you're going to face and you're going to, your, your tongue and your behavior are going to be tested. What's your response going to be? These are some of the things that God wants to work on all of us. All of us. God is working. He has begun that good work in us. And he will, Philippians 1.6 says, bring it to completion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you who began a good work in us are going to bring it to completion. That, that whether it's our tongue whether it's our thoughts, whether it's, you know, the, the things that we say or do, the way in which we behave with others. Lord, you are at work. You are bringing conviction. You do bring conviction to our hearts and to our lives. And we're so thankful that conviction is not just uh, something that you do. It's it's a kindness from you. It's a it's a mercy. It's It's a saying, you know what? My beloved son, my beloved daughter, don't go this way. Go this is this way. This is the way. This is the righteous way. So Lord, we thank you for conviction of sin. We thank you that that you show us the way in which we are to walk and the manner in which we are to walk in your word. So Lord, I pray that that even now that you you would do your work of conviction but also that you would bring comfort through your son who bled and died and rose in our place and for our sin. So Lord, we, we thank you for the gift of the righteousness of Christ in our place. There's no other hope, no hope without it. So we thank you for the hope that we have. And we freely confess and repent of, of, of our of the way in which we use our tongues and the way in which our behavior dishonors you. May we glorify you and honor you in all that we say and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.